Fellowship coming to you. We're kind of kicking off a new season here. We took a break and then we had a preview on Sunday morning and now today is September 10th and we're kind of uh, kicking off a new season of the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. And as promised, I said I was going to start talking from the subject, teaching from the subject, the uh, unrighteousness of racism. The unrighteousness of racism. You remember I was studying, we were studying Ephesians, and we had gotten as far as chapter 4 of the fivefold ministry. We had gotten as far as the apostle, the first one mentioned in the fivefold ministry. And I felt a tug in my spirit based on everything that's going on with uh, in, in the, the protests and with George Floyd and 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 uh, Amar Arbery. Uh, now we got the guy in Rochester, Daniel Prude, uh, the young man in Atlanta. I, I felt a tug in, especially the way some people in the government seem to be dismissive of the pain that African American, especially African American boys and men. Are feeling, And so I felt a tugging in my spirit to address this issue because many people who seem to have a dismissive attitude toward racial reconciliation, toward race relations, toward recognizing the pain that African Americans have endured for over 400 years, many of these people who seem to be, have a get over it attitude, many of them uh, claim the name of Christ. And so uh, I want to deal with this issue. And I'm going to deal with that issue also later. It won't be today, but I'll deal with the issue of the white, the white pastor. What is the white pastor's responsibility? What is the white preacher's responsibility? I'll deal with that issue, but it won't be today. It'll be in another session, probably next Thursday or something like that, because I've got a series of questions. I've been posting on Facebook. I've already posted, I think, five, the first five questions. I've got about 20 questions here. And as time goes on, I add to them. So let's uh, pray, and then we're going to we're going to talk from the subject: the unrighteousness of racism. The unrighteousness of racism. Let us pray, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you just for the privilege of mentioning your name, the name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and dominion, both now and forever. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us. You have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You are the only true and living God. All of the God's idols, they cannot help us, they cannot redeem us, they cannot reconcile us to you or to each other. You are the only true and living God. You are the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the God of all glory. We bless you and we praise you and we thank you for your redemption, your salvation, your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy, your kindness which you bestowed on us through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, for this country, for the government. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for racial and spiritual, Lord, reconciliation, which can only come through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and dominion, kingdom, both now and forever. Lord, grant me a measure of, of uh, grace upon grace, uh, a measure of uh, apostolic, spiritual, prophetic, pastoral, uh, teaching, uh, evangelistic anointing. Grant me grant me that, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. For I know, Lord, that no, no matter what I say, unless your Holy Spirit moves on the hearts of individuals, nothing will happen. For I know it is the Holy Spirit who gives life. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to the hearts, to the conscience of men uh, who brings life. So by Jesus Christ, we ask you this in all things. And we thank you again for allowing us the privilege of mentioning your blessed name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. Um, I want to talk to you tonight. Uh, I'm going to pick up at the first question. I'm going to try to not speculate a lot. One, number two, I'm not going to deal with a, a whole lot of religions outside of Christianity because I want to deal with the area that I'm most familiar with. I am a Christian. I am a born-again Christian. I was born again by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God. I was born again on the 20th of May, 1979. The Lord saved me. He called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. On the 20th of May, 1979, I was at Robbins Air Force Base. I was in the Air Force 
and I was lost, and the Lord saved me. Not only did he save me, he sanctified me. He set me apart for his holy purpose. Not only did he sanctify me, but he filled me with the Holy Spirit. He filled me with his Holy Spirit. This is the experience that all true Christians can claim. And so I'm going to speak mostly about Christianity because I don't, I don't want to, I cannot be an expert on Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Islam, etc., Judaism. And I'm not an expert on Christianity, but I, I, I am familiar with the Holy Scriptures much more than I am with the Quran. And, you know, I, I've studied some Islam, etc., as I was working on my doctorate. And uh, so I, I, I can mention some things about that, but I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to stay in my wheelhouse, as they say. And so we're going to talk tonight, um, I'll, I'll try not to be more than about an hour or so, and then we will, uh, we will proceed. Okay, so the first uh, question is, is there a biblical justification for racial superiority? That's question number one. Is there a biblical justification? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Bible. Is there a biblical, and here I'm talking about the Protestant Bible, the Bible that begins with Genesis and ends with the Revelation. Is there a biblical justification for racial superiority? Can a person, in all honesty, go to the Bible and say, here is where the Bible says that whites are superior to blacks? or blacks are superior to whites, or Hispanics are superior, or Asians are superior, or Indians are superior, etc. Here's where the Bible says it. Is there biblical, biblical, biblical justification for racial superiority? And the answer is no. The answer is no. There's nowhere in the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, where racial, where God uh, um, speaks to a prophet or apostle, a holy man or holy woman, and tells them to tell other people that they are racially superior to others. There's a difference between racial superiority and a sovereign choice of God to call out people for uh, and, and to give them promises. God called Abraham and made promises to him. And Abraham became the father of the Jewish nation. That's a sovereign choice of God. But when God called Abraham, he called Abraham out of an idol-worshipping family. Abraham was originally from Ur of the Chaldees in the area of Mesopotamia. So originally Abraham was a Gentile and God called him in Genesis chapter 12. God called Abraham and said, leave your family and, and, and walk and, and come with me and I'm going to make you a great man and you're going to be a blessing unto, uh, um, unto the nations and through you all, in, all nations of the world will be blessed and whoever blesses you will be blessed and whoever curses you will be cursed. So if you look in Genesis uh, from chapter 12 through, I'm going to say chapter 25, you, you get the life, the ministry, the death, the trials, the tribulations of Abraham. But nowhere does the Bible preach or teach in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Nowhere does the Bible justify racial superiority. Nowhere. Nowhere does the Bible justify racial superiority. Let me tell you one thing that did happen, and this is very important that you know this, especially if you're African American. What some people did they took the Bible and they tried to justify their ideas of racial superiority. When, when Africans were, were brought here as slaves in the Atlantic slave trade by the slave power, the slave power took the Bible and took some scriptures and, 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 some, mis, and, some, and some tragic misinterpretations of scriptures and tried to use the Bible to justify their idea of racial superiority. Let, let me give you one teaching. It was a damnable teaching. It was a teaching from the bowels of hell. It's called pre, P-R-E, pre-Adamism. Adam as in Adam and Eve. Pre-Adamism. It is not found in the Bible. But there were those, especially in the 19th and 18th century, in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, but especially in the, uh, in the, in the uh, 18th and 19th century, which would have been the 1700s 
in the 1800s, before slavery ended uh, in 1865 in this country. There were those who taught pre-Adamism. If you remember, Adam and Eve were the first people created by God. God created Adam, and then out of Adam, he created Eve. This is in Genesis uh, chapter 2. But there were those who taught that black people came from a subhuman race that existed before Adam. That's why it's called pre-Adamism. Pre, P-R-E, before. Pre-Adamism. So there were those, including some in the clergy, who taught pre-Adamism. In other words, you cannot enslave a person unless you make that person believe that he or she is inferior to you. You, can't enslave, you cannot enslave a person and, and uplift that person and encourage that person at the same time. You have to somehow psychologically, mentally, or physically, or all, beat that person down and tell that person that person is less than human and that it was God's plan that this person be beat down and, and treated uh, as less than human. Pre-Adamism taught that black people came were a subhuman species that existed before Adam. And that's just not true. There were animals that existed before Adam. God created man last and then created woman from man. So there were animals and plants, etc., that existed before Adam. But there was no subhuman species out of which came black people. And see, that's, that's one of the problems that you get when you believe in evolution. If you believe in evolution, the part that says that man comes from primates, that damnable teaching about pre-Adamism flows from the filthy river of evolution. If you can believe that man came from primates, then you're only that far from believing that black people came from a, 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 a pre-Adamic subhuman race of something. So that the pre-Adamism is a lie, but it was used to justify slavery. Again, you cannot, you cannot enslave somebody unless you make that person think that he or she is inferior. So pre-Adamism is a lie. There is no biblical justification uh, for racial superiority. The Jews are a called out people, but that doesn't make them superior to anyone. They, all men have about 98% of the same genetic structure. So the Jews were a called out people. God called the Jews and, and promised them through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc., David, etc., promised the Jews the land of Israel, Canaan, Canaan land, if you will. So the Jews were a called out people, but they were not superior to anyone uh, genetically, etc. But God, in his sovereign decision, God makes sovereign decisions because he's God. He can do that. He doesn't have to ask anybody. And he made a sovereign decision to call Abraham and, and say, wherever you walk, I'm going to give it to you. And Abraham walked, etc. And so the Jews eventually inhabited Canaan land, if you read the uh, first five books of the Bible. And then they went into the Canaan land uh, in Joshua, shortly after Moses died. But there is no biblical justification for a theory of racial superiority. It does not exist in the Bible. It's, it's, it's what, what, what man has done. Man has, as he often does, he has perverted the scriptures. And one of the main doctrines that man used, and it was, it was, it was supported by clergy, by scientists, by social scientists. So, so when you had all these people with respected uh, titles and, and, and alphabet after their names, when you had all these people agreeing that the black man was inferior and that he was from a pre-Adamic subhuman race of uh, primates or whatever, that's where pre-Adamism came from. Just when you get a chance, Google pre-Adamism and see what it pulls up. There was an article I wanted to read, but they wanted me to pay $39 just for the article, and I wasn't going to do that. I, I don't even pay that much for books. So there's no way I was going to pay $39, $40 to get the scholarly article on pre-Adamism, I, because I basically know what it means. Pre-Adamism is a lie. Racial superiority with the Bible 
as a support for it is a lie. That's question number one. I hope I've answered it adequately. Question number two, what is the correct interpretation of Noah's curse upon Ham in Genesis? This is another uh, thing that was used by the slave power to justify not only slavery, but the but the inhuman the, the inhumanity that occurred during slavery. Not just slavery itself, but the inhumanity that occurred during slavery. The black man was told, "Well, you're cursed. God cursed you because of the curse that uh, that Noah put upon uh, his son Ham." Well, ring, 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 ring. There's no such thing as a curse that Noah put upon his son Ham. I'm going to read the passage to you, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's in Genesis chapter 9. After Noah and his sons and their wives, including Noah's wife, after they had been in the ark for about 378 days, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but they were in the ark much longer than that because the waters had to recede, etc. And one scholar estimates they were in the ark about 378 days or slightly more than a year. After they came out of the ark, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 9, it says Noah planted a vineyard. Noah planted a vineyard in Genesis 9, 20. Noah began to be an husband and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine. And he got drunk. Noah got drunk. And it says he was uncovered within his tent. He got drunk, as people often do. And he was uncovered in his tent, as often happens when people drink too much or they're, they're intoxicated by some other substance. They become uncovered, etc. And so Noah was uncovered. Genesis 9, 21. Now we go to Genesis 9, 22. And Ham... The father of Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem became the father of the Jews, the Shemites. That's why we say if a person doesn't like Jews, they are anti-Semitic. Right? So the Shemites are, are where the Jews came from. So you got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The African Americans, or Africans, I should say, Africans come from Ham, and then Japheth is 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 thought to be the father of, of of whites and some other races of people. But Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. He told he told Shem and Japheth, "Dad is naked. He's drunk. He's naked. We don't know what we don't know what kind of relationship that Noah had with his son Ham." It may have been a contentious relationship. They may have been fussing while they were on the ark for over a year. So, so you know, if you've, had, if you've got three, four, five children, it's possible that one or two of those children are problematic. It's possible that Ham was a problematic child. It's possible that he and Noah had clashed. The Bible doesn't say because the Bible doesn't tell us everything that goes on in family dynamics, etc. But it is possible that, that Noah and Ham and it's possible that Ham had some kind of grudge against Noah and it was waiting for him to you know, mess up because Noah was a righteous man. The Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years before, uh, before God uh, brought the flood. He preached for 100 It had never rained on the earth. And Noah built the ark and said, it's, you know, it's going to rain. It's gonna, and people laughing at him, etc., because it had never rained before. Up until that time, the earth had been watered by a mist. It had never rained. And he's building this boat, this ark. And he's saying it's going to rain. And people are like mocking him, laughing at him, probably throwing spitballs at him and stuff like that. And so finally when it began to rain, they were on that ship with all those animals, etc. Noah, his wife, his sons, his sons and their wives, eight people and all the animals, etc. God knows what kind of sanitation system they had with all those animals and insects, etc. And so we don't know the, the we don't know the dynamics of the relationship between Noah and his son Ham. So they get off the ship. Noah plants a vineyard. He builds an altar to the Lord. He plants a vineyard because he had never been a husbandman before. This is something 
before the ark, he had not been a husband, to our knowledge. So he gets off the ship after being on there with seven other people and a, and a bunch of animals that he had to get onto the ship in the first place. And then he gets off the ship and he plants a vineyard and he has too much, he drinks. He probably doesn't realize the power of the, of the, of the fermentation of what he was drinking. So he gets drunk and he's uncovered. Now exactly how he was uncovered, how much of his body was uncovered, etc. we don't know. Possibly all of it. But Ham saw his father naked and he told his two brethren. So he was like mocking his father. Again, we don't know the family dynamic. It's possible that Noah and Ham didn't get along. I don't know. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying I don't know. But when he told Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers, instead of joining Ham in the mocking and the celebration of their father's nakedness, the Bible says that Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. So Shem and Japheth retained the respect that they had toward their father. They didn't join Ham in mocking the father. They took a garment and they walked backwards. They put the garment on their shoulders. They bore the burden of forgiveness and, and, and they, covered, they covered their father's nakedness. And their faces were, were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. They did not look upon, even though there was no law of Moses at this time, morally speaking, the law that, that was within the moral conscience said that it was, it was wrong to look upon your parents' nakedness. Even though the law of Moses would come uh, much later after Moses was born and went to the top of Mount Sinai and received the oracles um, through angels. It was you know, Moses received the law. Ten Commandments, etc. They saw not their father's nakedness, and Noah awoke from his wine. And he, he, he knew what his younger son, Ham, had done unto him. Now, verse 25 is the verse that we really got to pay attention to. He said, Cursed be Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. He didn't curse Ham. See, we, the black man was told, and we were told that Noah cursed Ham. He didn't curse Ham. He cursed one of, Ham, uh, one of um, um, Ham's four sons. Ham had four sons. One of them was Canaan. Abraham, not Abraham, uh, Noah cursed Canaan. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Here I'm showing you what the truth is, but I'm also showing you how people have taken the scriptures and perverted them for their own wicked purposes. Because the black man was told that God cursed Ham, and therefore the black man was cursed to be a servant, a slave, a hewer of wood, and a drawer of water. But that's not what the scripture says. The Canaanites were cursed. Canaan was cursed. And if you go on and read in the scriptures, the Canaanites, once they migrated uh, uh, um, the those who were descended, the Canaanites became a very wicked people. The enemies of Israel, very wicked people. And if you notice, if you read the scriptures in Genesis, many of them migrated and settled around Sodom and Gomorrah. So that would tell you what kind of wickedness they were involved in. But Noah didn't say, curse it be Ham. He went to the next generation. He said, curse it be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Shem became the father of the Jews. And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, the, the other son of Noah. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And there are many scriptures that, that back that up about how the Jew and the Gentile and how the Gentile will eventually in the millennial king, kingdom uh, be subservient to, in certain ways to the Jews and how the, the uh, uh, Gentiles will dwell in the tents of the Jews, etc. But you would have to study biblical prophecy to really understand that. But Noah did not say, curse it be Ham. He said, curse it be Canaan. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. Do you see that? Canaan shall be his servant. 
And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. But people who perverted the scriptures, they took that and, and, and used it against the black man. And remember, when Africans were bought here, or uh, brought here, they didn't speak English. They spoke the languages and dialects of their native tribes in Africa. They didn't learn English pretty much until they came here. Some may have learned some English over in Africa by being exposed to English speaking people, but most of the English that Africans learned, they learned by being exposed to English in the colonies, in the New World, as they called it. And so, the, and so they were being told, this Bible here says that God has cursed you. You are to be our slave, a hewer of wood, and a drawer of water. But Noah cursed, he said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And again, if you read the story of the Canaanites, they became very wicked, licentious, sexually immoral people. And many of them settled around Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because the Bible says that the men of Sodom that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah were exceedingly wicked. Exceedingly wicked. But here's my point. It is a perversion of scripture to say that God cursed the black man because Noah cursed Ham. Noah didn't curse Ham. Noah cursed Canaan. And, the, and, the, and black people uh, are not descended from Canaan. They're descended from Ham. So that, that's, 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 a, um, that's how we destroy that myth. Question number three. Can you be a good Christian or other religion and be a racist? Can you be a good Christian or other religion and be a racist? No, the answer is no. You cannot be a good Christian or other religion, but I'll, 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 I'll concentrate on Christianity. You cannot be a good Christian and be a racist. No, because a racist believes in racial superiority. I, I believe I'm, good as, I'm as good as anybody, but I don't believe I'm better than anybody because of the color of my skin, etc. But I believe that I am as good as anybody else because we were all created by God. But I don't believe I'm better than white people or better than Hispanics. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, uh, I don't personally, I believe the homosexual lifestyle, I know it is, uh, it's, it's spoken against in the scriptures, but I don't believe I'm better than gay people. I'm not better than they are. I believe I've made some better choices than they have, but I'm not better than gay people. I'm not better than white people. I'm not better than Latinos. I'm not better than Asians. I'm not better than Native Americans. So if there's a person who's a Christian and, and, that, and that person is a racist, then that Christian, there's a there's a there's a, a defect in that person's relationship, both with God and with his or her fellow man. Because the Bible says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, meekness, etc. Against such there is no law, meaning there's no condemnation, because the law, especially the law of Moses, the law came to condemn sin. And to believe yourself to be better, whether Dr. Martin Luther King said a doctrine of black supremacy is just as dangerous as a doctrine of white supremacy. So to believe that you're better than someone because your, your skin, uh, as Malcolm X said, because your skin looks like gold, because to believe you're better than somebody else is sin, it's wrong. But to believe that you're better than somebody else because you're white and, you're, and you bask in your white privilege that's sin. That's wrong. So if there are Christians, and I'm sure there are, if there are Christians who are racist, or Muslims, or, or Hindus, etc., but let's, let's concentrate on Christianity. If there are Christians who are racist, and I'm sure there are, they're wrong. They're not walking in love. They're not walking in the fruit of the Holy Spirit based on Galatians chapter 5 and uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Let me read 2 Peter chapter 1 to you. Let me read it to you from the uh, 
the New American Standard Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let me show you, if, let me ask you after I read this, I'm, 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 asking, I'm going to ask you now, is racism compatible with what I'm about to read to you? 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter says that God has granted us to be partakers of his divine nature. So if God has granted us to be partakers of his divine nature, how does racism, how does a, a feeling of racial superiority fit into that? It doesn't. For these, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now for this very region, reason also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. How is racism compatible with moral excellence? It's not. Knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. How, 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 how are brotherly kindness and racism compatible? They're not. How, you, how can you demonstrate brotherly kindness towards somebody and you believe that you're superior to that person because of your race? Peter says here, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, then he, he, he ends it by saying, love. The greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and charity, Paul said. But the greatest of these is charity, is love. Agape love, especially. Peter says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, the King James says, and abound, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as Christians, we, we sometimes get off track. Peter said, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. So if there are racist, if there are Christians who are racist, they're blind, they've been blinded, they're short-sighted. They got off track. And that is possible. I'm not going to tell you that you can't be Christian and be a racist. There are Christians who are racist. But they're not walking in love. They're not walking in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They're off track. There's a defect there. You, you can't say you love the Lord in the biblical sense of love. You believe that you're better than somebody else. That's a, that's a moral defect that has to be corrected. First, the person has to acknowledge it, as many people are acknowledging through uh, a lot of racial reconciliation efforts that are going on. There are a lot of people, including a lot of white people, who are acknowledging the sordid, the sad racial history of the United States of America, of the world in general, but of the United States specifically. And so they are, they're, 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 they are engaging in racial reconciliation. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So if you got saved 15 years ago and you're a racist, you've forgotten that, 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 that the Lord save you from your sin. Racism is a sin. That's why when people say, uh, when will racism end? I just shake my head. It's going to end when sin ends. And sin is not going to end until the Lord Jesus comes back and brings a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. As long as there's sin, there's going to be racism. Because racism is sin. People were thinking when Obama was when Barack Obama was elected as president, oh, it's, we're in a post-racial age. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Because Obama became president, what, that, that, that means that, that we're going to all see come by yacht? No. There was, a, there was an exponential growth of white supremacist groups when he announced for president for, for, for the presidency. Not not when he became president, when he announced for the presidency. There was an exponential growth of white supremacy groups, chattering and uh, internet blog groups, etc. He had to have Secret Service protection earlier than any other presidential candidate. You know why, because he's a black man with a permanent tan. So racism is sin. As long as there's sin there will be racism. But one day, in the new heaven and the new earth, wherein total righteousness dwells, there will be no more racism, but not until then. For he who lacks these qualities, Peter said, is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. 
Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling. See, we have a calling, but we have a responsibility to make that calling sure. He says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. The Christian who's, who's, who's practicing racism is stumbling, is in darkness, and cannot see that that darkness has blinded his or her eyes. You can't, you can't, you can't exhibit the love of God. The love of God in Christ. The Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. You cannot exhibit the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given unto us. And you think you're better than, 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 than the Asians or, or the Native Americans. Or you think you're better than black people. Or you think you're better than white people. You can't do that. Because, again, the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. So you cannot be a good Christian and be a racist. It's impossible. Because that is a, that is a sin where Dr. King said that segregation assumes that God made a mistake. The segregationist is implying, if not stating, that God made some kind of mistake when he created the black man or whoever is being segregated. You're saying God made a mistake, and God doesn't make mistakes. We make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. So uh, Dr. King said segregation assumes, and I'm paraphrasing him, but this is what he said in one of his, his sermons. I can't remember the name of the sermon. But segregation assumes that God made a mistake. When, when, when you, you say, I need you to sit in the back of the bus, or I need you to uh, suffer, uh, you, you can't share in the resources that God has given this country because you're black, because you're, because you're uh, poor white, or because you're Latin, Latinx, or because you're Native American. You can't share in the constitutional blessings that God has given this country, even though you were here thousands of years before the Mayflower. That's a sin, and God hates it, and it's something that needs to be repented of if it dwells within our hearts. All right, so, the, so question number three, can you be a good Christian and be a racist? The answer is no. The answer is no. Question four, does God favor one race over others? Does God favor one race over others? No, because the Bible says in several places that God is no respecter of persons. Now, God can make a sovereign decision, as he did. He called Abraham, and out of Abraham came Isaac, and out of Isaac came Jacob, and out of Jacob came the 12 uh, patriarchs, the 12 tribes. God can make a sovereign decision. That, that's, that's God. He's sovereign. He can make any decision he wants. Somebody once said, God being sovereign means he's God and we're not. God can make a sovereign decision, right? But God is no respecter of persons. He is a respecter of principles, but he's no respecter of persons. So the, so the question, does God favor one race over others? In the sense that God is no respecter of persons, no. But in the sense that God can make a sovereign decision, God did call the Jews. He, he did call Abraham, but he called Abraham out of, a, out of an idol-worshipping Gentile family. Out of Ur of the Chaldees, of, of Ur of the Chaldees, out of the area of Mesopotamia. So God can make a sovereign choice. But 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 the Bible says concerning salvation. God's uh, God through the apostle Paul said that salvation is offered first to the Jews. Jesus said it himself. He said salvation is of or from the Jews. He, he told the woman at the well that salvation is of the Jews. Meaning the Jews were given the promises, the oracles of God. They were given the, the promises, the land, etc. That's a sovereign decision that God made. There's, no, there's nothing that anybody can um, say about that. When you hear these countries saying they're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, nobody's going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth because Israel is a chosen nation of God. They now exist in blindness. Blindness, most of them don't believe, as a nation, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So they are in blindness right now. 
but one day they would be reconciled to God. Jesus said to the Jews himself, he said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One day the Jews will say to Yeshua HaMashiach, Joshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord will come back and save Israel. The Bible says all Israel shall be saved. So calling of the Jews is a sovereign decision. But as far as salvation, Paul says in Romans, he says salvation is offered to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. It was offered to the Jew first. They rejected Jesus. He was crucified. And then we rose from the dead and the New Testament church was formed. The gospel was first preached to the Jew at the day of Pentecost. But then it was preached to the Gentile. But then Paul goes on to say in Romans that tribulation and patience will also be uh, awarded. I'm sorry, tribulation and anguish. Judgment will, will be given to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Then Paul goes on and says, for well, there is no respect of persons with God. So the Jew can't. The Jew cannot say I'm saved because he is a Jew or she's a Jew. The Jew has to come through Jesus Christ, just like the Gentiles do. John the Baptist uh, um, uh, preached that when the, the religious leaders came to him, and they came to him all, you know, puffed up in, you know, their religious Jewish pride. And John the Baptist said, think not to say within yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. He was telling them, don't depend on your Jewish lineage to, to, uh, to uh, connect you to God. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For God, this is what John the Baptist said, for God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He was telling these Jews, don't, don't, don't come to my revival <laughs> with all this pride and all this, you know, we're, we're Jewish and so, you know, we, we got it going on. God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. As, as God told Moses, get out of my way. I'm going to wipe out this whole nation and create a whole new nation. And then Moses made intercession, and God didn't do it. So the Jew has to come by the cross. And many Jews don't want to do that. They don't want to come by the cross. They don't believe that that, they don't believe that, that itinerant preacher from Galilee died, who died on the cross, they don't believe he's Yeshua Ha, Mashiach. Joshua the Messiah, but he is. And there are many Messianic Jews, Jews who believe that Jesus is Messiah. There are, there are many Jews who are saved, but as a nation as a whole, the Jewish nation is, even though it was reformed in 1948, the Jewish nation is still walking in blindness. But one day that blindness will end. Question number five, is there biblical justification for believing that Jesus is white? or black, or whatever. Is there biblical justification for believing that Jesus is white or black? Well, however, however the Jews of Jesus' day looked when Jesus walked the earth, however the Jews of that day in that area of the world looked, that's how Jesus looked. However the Jews looked, the Bible says that one of Jesus' earthly ancestors, David, he was ruddy, of a ruddy complexion. Ruddy, R-U-D-D-Y. He was of a ruddy complexion. And ruddy in Hebrew and in English means reddish, reddish. Now, does that mean Jesus looked exactly like that? Not necessarily, because I have children, one who's light skin and one who's dark skin. And they both have the same parents, both the same mother and neither father. So... But the point I'm making is, however the Jews of that day looked, that's how Jesus looked. And we pretty much have to leave it at that. But I do understand the concern of those who, who, um, who, who uh, um, are vexed because there are those who insist that Jesus is some uh, white man who looks like he's on his way to Woodstock. Normally in this country, when we see Jesus, when we see, um, when we see depictions of Jesus, he looks like a, he looks like the white guy that used to sell weed on my street when I when I was growing up. There was a white guy who used to sell weed on my street. I won't say his name, but I remember his name, and he had a girlfriend, 
and we'd go into his house and he'd let us smoke some of his weed uh, out of his pipe, the bong. And he would sell us weed at a little bit of a discount. And what the, bro the brothers were selling it for 200 a pound. He, he would sell it for like 165. He was undercutting the brothers. But, but, but most depictions of Jesus that you see look like this guy who lived on my street, a white guy. One of the only white people who lived on the street at that time, because the, the neighborhood had changed over from predominantly white to predominantly black. He might have been undercover now that I look back on it. But, you know, he never, I don't know whatever happened. But most depictions of Jesus have him looking with the long hair, and et cetera. So Jesus, the depiction of Jesus as this uh, European-looking white guy, as they say in the South, that dog don't hunt. This European-looking white guy who looks like he's on his way to Woodstock, I like to say. He look, looks like he's on his way to Woodstock. That's probably very inaccurate. However, the Jews, because Jesus was a Jew, to quote Dr. Fruchtenbaum in one of his books, Jesus was a Jew. He's of the lineage of the house of the tribe of David. The tribe of Judah, I should say. The house of David. Jesus was a Jew. So however the Jews looked in, at that time, just like the people I grew up in, the neighborhood I grew up in, I looked like the people I grew up around. We were, we were all African Americans, etc. a couple of white people. But the neighborhood, as I said, it changed over. But we all looked you know, like African Americans looked in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So however the Jews looked then, that's how Jesus looked. There is a book, I have the book, I haven't read it. You know, sometimes you'll buy a book and you don't, you, you, you get busy with something else, you don't read it. But there is a book, I have it on my Kindle, it's called uh, When Jesus Became White. So, I, but I haven't, I haven't read it, so I, I can't, I can't attest to what it says. But I can tell by the title that, it, that the person is probably saying that Jesus uh, originally started out as black and then, be, and then through, um, medieval artists, etc., eventually became white, 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 lily white. I mean, there are some people who say, yo, yeah, everybody knows Jesus is white. Well, no, everybody, no, we don't know that. We, we, whatever the Jews look like. I'm not going to tell you he's lily white. I'm not going to tell you he's black as midnight. However the Jews looked at that time. When was Jesus born? He was born in about 4 B.C. And he was crucified in 29 um, A.D. So however the Jews looked at that time in, 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 uh, in that part of the world, in, especially the Jews of, of those tribes, the tribe of Judah, that's how Jesus looked. And guess what? We, we pretty much have to leave it at that. Because that's a, that can become a distraction. Getting, oh, Jesus, oh, no, he looked like, uh, you know, Isaac Hayes. And, oh, no, no, he didn't. He looked like... Uh, you know, he was white as uh, Queen Elizabeth. That's a distraction. The blood that he shed at the cross, we know that was red. There's no doubt that blood was, there's no doubt his blood was red. The blood that he shed at Calvary's cruel cross was red. All right. Let's see. I don't want to get into this tonight about the proper interpretation of Revelation 1, 14 and 15. I want to wait. Uh, I want to wait. Let me let me let me begin it, <laughs> but I want to wait till Sunday to really get into that. Let me read the passage to you. Let me read it to you from the New King James Version. This this is a, and, and I'm going to make a couple of points, and then I'm going to close, and then we'll come back in uh, on Sunday. All right. If you if you go to Revelation chapter one, the first chapter of the last book of the Protestant Bible. The reason I say Protestant because because there's a Catholic Bible that's not the same. It's got the Apocrypha in there, right? Uh, the Gospel according to Thomas and all that kind of stuff. The Protestant Bible, Genesis through Revelation, is the one that I, I reference. All right? In the, in the uh, first chapter of the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, in chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 9. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail tonight, but I want to just set the stage. John, the apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation in about 95 A.D. or about, 
resurrection about about 65 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, of the 12 apostles, John is the only one who was not martyred. Mark was not martyred, was not killed uh, by the enemies of, of the gospel, as Peter was, Paul, etc. Thomas, they were all martyred. John is the only one who was not martyred. He writes Revelation around 95 AD during the rule, the reign of the emperor, Roman emperor Domitian. And Domitian wanted emperor worship. And John said, we're not having that. I'm not pinching, uh, I'm not pinching in my people. We're not pinching incense to Caesar. Domitian. We worship the only true and living. Remember, John was a Jew, so he knew the Jewish Shema. Behold, the Lord our God is one God. He, there's no way he was going to he was going to pinch incense to to some pagan god. He wasn't going to do that. So and so Domitian said, "Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to do a Birmingham jail on you." Uh, so he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And although Domitian thought he had gotten rid of John, this old troublemaking preacher here, the the, the spirit of God cannot be confined. The Lord Jesus in glory in his glorified. And that's very important that you see this. The Lord Jesus, in his glorified appearance, appeared unto John while John was on the Isle of Patmos. This is not Jesus on the cross, bleeding and beaten so badly you couldn't recognize him. He appeared as the glorified Christ. He appeared like he appeared when he took James, John, and Peter up to the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. All right? So John says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, you hear that? In the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. John says, I was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. Why was he on the Isle of Patmos? For the word of God. Not, not because he got invited to preach a revival. He was on the Isle of Patmos because of his fidelity to the word of God. I was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. You hear that? I heard behind me the loud voice, uh, a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So this is Jesus talking to him. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus says the same thing that Jehovah said in, in Isaiah 44 and 6 and a few other places in the Old Testament. I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. What you see Write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. John was saying, well, who in the world is this? I heard a voice like a trumpet. Right? Who is this? And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So John is going to see a, a lot of symbolism. I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Son of Man is a messianic title for Jesus. You'll find it in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Son of Man. Now, there were other individuals called Son of Man, Ezekiel, etc., in the Old Testament. But when Jesus called the Son of Man, it has, a, it, has a, it has a greater significance than to call Ezekiel the Son of Man. Calling Ezekiel the Son of Man just means that he's a, a descendant of Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman. When Jesus was called the Son of Man, that's a messianic title. It's a title of deity, even though it says Son of Man. It's a messianic title if you look at Daniel 7, 13, and 14. I saw one like the Son of Man, not a Son of Man, like Ezekiel or Isaiah or Hosea or Zechariah or Zephaniah, the Son of Man, the definite article, clothed with a garment down to the feet. He's describing what he saw. And girded about the chest, the, the King James says the paps. I remember when I first saw that, when I first got saved, I, I was reading the King James, and it said girded about the paps. I didn't know what paps were. What are paps? What breasts? Blessed are the paps that you sucked, somebody once said to Jesus. Right. So girded about the paps, but a more modern version, knowing that we don't use the word paps, right? The more modern version says the chest. He was girded about the chest with a golden band. So he was dressed like the hot in his high priestly garment. 
Now, here's the part that's controversial, and I don't want to get into it tonight, but I will get into it Sunday morning. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Some people try to use that passage. Even some scholars, some seminarians, I've heard seminarians, especially at ITC, which is a predominantly black seminary, I've heard some, uh, I've heard some professors try to use this passage to justify and say that Jesus uh, um, was black. His head and hair, his head and hair were white like wool. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. You had to compare it with something that was contemporary to that time. You couldn't say his head and hair were white as an iPhone 12 because they didn't exist yet. So you couldn't compare it to his head and his hair were white as that Mercedes Benz I saw on the lot yesterday. He had to compare it with something that people could identify with of that culture. White as wool. You remember there's a very agrarian culture and sheep herding, right, was one of the predominant professions. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass. That's another passage that's used to try to justify, oh, Jesus was a Negro. His feet were like fine brass, as if they burned or as if refined in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Not muddy waters. He's a blues guitarist. Many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. That's symbolism. Out of his, but the symbolism points to a reality. Out of, his, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance or his appearance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now John had been with Jesus for three and a half years during, the, during Jesus' earthly ministry, but here he sees the glorified Christ. He has the same reaction that Peter, James, and John had at the Mount of Transfiguration. See, we're not looking at Mary's baby here. We're not looking at him on the cross. We're looking at the glorified Christ. We're looking at Christ in his splendor. We're looking at Christ in his high priestly office. And John says, when I saw him, I was slain in the spirit. And it wasn't no phony slain in the spirit where somebody put their hand on my forehead and pushed me to the ground, glory to the Lamb of God. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I were dead. You'll find a lot of that even in the Old Testament when men see angels and, and theophanies. They'll fall down like Daniel. And you'll, they'll, they'll fall as though they're dead because they're in the presence of majesty, in the presence of a heavenly being, whether it be a, a, an appearance of Christ as a theophany or, or an angel. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. Because there was symbolism, but the symbolism points to a reality. The myth, so Jesus said, now I'm going to show you what the mystery of the seven stars is. The mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. King James would say candlesticks, but lampstands is a better translation. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, or messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. But go back to the passage that I'm going to get to on Sunday, then I'll close. What is important is that we look at the scripture in its context. Con means with. C-O-N, with. So context means with the text. What is also important is that we not try to extract only those things that will make our interpretation of the Bible fit our interpretation of the Bible. You can't cherry pick scripture. That's one of the most dangerous. That's how cults get started. They'll cherry pick scripture. You can't cherry pick part of this passage and leave the other passage or other part of the passage a pericope. You can't, you, you can't leave the other part unexplained. You can't say that his head was like wool without explaining. It says, I'm sorry, you can't say his hair was white like wool as white as snow 
without also explaining, it says his head and his hair. So if you say that the fact that his hair was like wool, and it doesn't say the texture of his hair was wool. It says that his hair was white like wool, as white as snow. You can't concentrate on the, the hair and then don't say anything about the head because that's eisegesis when you just pull out of the scripture what you want to pull out to make it fit your theology. Cults do it all the time, but also, you know, preachers do it. But it's a dangerous practice. You've got to get the scriptures in. Remember I told you about how people took the Bible and, and said that the black man was cursed because Noah had cursed um, Ham. Noah didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be. God bless the tents of Shem and Japheth. And Canaan shall be their servant. So you see, people took that passage and they twisted it. They perverted it for their own racial theory of racial superiority. Well, you, if, if, if that's wrong to do that in Genesis, it's wrong to do it in Revelation. Now, I'll talk about this on Sunday. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now. But you can't say, oh, yeah, his hair, was, his, his, his hair was like wool. Oh, Jesus, black man. It says his hair and his head were white. So, so if you can say the, 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 the hair, you know, like wool, oh, Jesus was black. So when the white man could come back and say, well, no, it says his head, his head was white. Jesus was white. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't cherry pick scripture. You can cherry pick other stuff can't cherry pick scripture it's a very dangerous and dishonest disingenuous thing to do so I want to deal with revelation on Sunday morning that's, that's question number six and then I'll, I'll try to deal with question number seven what might be the rationale for the mostly white Christians unwavering support for President Trump even after the revelations about the military even after the revelations about the, uh, his knowledge of COVID-19, he still has his 35, 40%. It's like, uh oh, I'm riding or dying with Donald Trump. What might explain that? We'll talk about that on Sunday. But I want to talk about this revelation passage also. Let's be honest when we're dealing with God's word. We don't, all, we don't understand everything about it. I'm, I'm, I'm taking some postdoctoral courses right now. And these professors who've got PhDs and stuff, they say, well, we, you know, we're not sure here. It could be this or it could be that. Or it could, well, nobody understands the Bible in its totality. But what God has given us to understand, we should be honest. We shouldn't try to make scripture fit our cultural, uh, 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 you know, paradigm. That's because if it's wrong for the white man to do it, it's also wrong for everybody else to do it. So we'll talk about Revelation, that, that passage there. We'll talk about that, Lord willing, on Sunday as well as question seven. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of mentioning your name, the name of your dear son, Jesus Christ, your dear son, your dear son, your dear son, Jesus, our Lord, crucified through voluntary weakness, yet raised by your glorious power. Blessed be his name. He's seated at your right hand in glory until you make his enemies his footstool. Glory to the Lamb of God, Father. We thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank you, Lord, that you saved us. You called us out of darkness in your marvelous light. You saved us by your sovereign decision that you made. You elected us. We are elect according to your foreknowledge. Hallelujah. How do we know we're in? How do we know we're elect? Because your word says it. And we know we're elect because we will endure. The, the elect endure. The elect cannot be lost because we're elect. You have elected us. You've chosen us. You've called us out of darkness. In the uh, not just light, it's your marvelous light. It's your Shekinah glory. Hallelujah, God. We thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you. Help us, God. Touch this nation, Lord. Help us, Lord. You said you shed your grace. We said you, that you shed your grace upon us. And perhaps we've misused that, Lord. Forgive us, please. We make intercession now for this nation, for the government. We make intercession now for those who, Lord, won't speak truth to power, who are in positions of authority, secular and sacred, to do so. If they won't speak truth to power, Lord God, we pray that you give them courage that they would do so. 
by Jesus Christ, we ask you and we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you, my beloved. I'm glad to be back. I took a little break. I just finished working on my PhD. And um, um, I just thought I would take a little break there. But I'm glad to be back with where, where every Thursday evening at 8 o'clock and every Sunday morning at uh, 11 a.m. So if you're not already obligated to another ministry, uh, please join us. We'll, we'll continue on Sunday morning with uh, questions 6 and 7, and we may even go beyond that. But we know we'll do 6 and 7. God bless you, my beloved. You be strong in the Lord and the power of might. Continue to wear your mask. I don't care what these politicians say. Continue to wear your mask. Continue to minimize your contact with large crowds and wear your mask. God bless you, my beloved. We'll see you again, Lord willing, on Sunday morning. Take care. Bye-bye.